Welcome to Mexico Matters, the CSIS podcast about how events occurring in Mexico can impact, and more importantly, matter in the United States. I am Mariana Campero, non-resident senior associate of the Americas program at CSIS and the former CEO of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations, COMEXI. Mexico has a very large and diversified base of energy sources. And according to McKinsey, Mexico could also become a global energy powerhouse if it pursued the right investments. I would add that in order for these investments to materialize, we actually also need to respect the legal framework and offer regulatory certainty. To discuss the current state of Mexico's energy infrastructure and what will it take for us to achieve this potential, that it is truly my pleasure to welcome Tania Ortiz Mena, president of SEMPRA Infrastructure, which is headquartered in Houston. Tania, welcome to Mexico Matters and really congratulations on your new role as president. Wow, it is really, really cool to see a Mexican woman helping enable the global energy transition. What a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. It is a wonderful opportunity, a great responsibility, for sure. Tania, as you know, Mexico is at a critical moment. Amid a global rearrangement of supply chains, we will actually be heading into a presidential election which could define whether or not we will be able to take full advantage of the nearshoring opportunity. Thus, ensuring reliable, abundant, and clean energy will be critical for that goal. Yet, we have seen in the last few years a reversal in key energy investments, including in infrastructure. What can you tell us about the current state of Mexico's energy sector? Let me start by saying that Mexico has an enormous opportunity to take advantage of what we call this uh, near-shoring, reshoring, French-shoring, whatever you can call it, where we're going from more of a globalized economy to a regionalized economy that seeks to uh, strengthen supply chains within a region. And Mexico, of course, is ideally located and has free trade agreements in place to take advantage of this situation. But in order to be able to really materialize the full potential of this opportunity, which I am convinced it's it's a one in a generation opportunity. And that had to do with many, I will call it external factors that led to where we are today. It is critical that Mexico ensures an appropriate supply of energy. And by appropriate energy, it has to be clean or let's say cleaner. And I'm sure we'll talk about energy transition cleaner, reliable, and affordable energy. And Mexico has today the ideal, I would call it the fundamental conditions to take advantage of its energy potential. First, we have abundant clean energy in Mexico. Not every country has it. And people think that places where it's simply very sunny or very windy, then you can produce renewable power. But that's not sufficient. You need very large extensions of land. You need certain temperatures. So very particular conditions to be able to, to again, realize the full potential of renewable energy. Mexico has that. Mexico is one of the best locations to produce solar energy to produce wind energy. But in addition, we have another key component that's natural gas. People have been talking about energy transition now for many years, but the component of energy security has also become more and more clear as we've seen the war in Ukraine break out or as we saw during the COVID pandemic, how regional supply chains or energy, I would say energy security is also critical for economic development. So that brings in another component, which is today natural gas. Availability of abundant and low-cost natural gas, which today is produced in the United States. The United States today is the world's largest exporter of natural gas and one of the main producers of natural gas. 
and the market for that natural gas is Mexico. So we have access, when we speak about, let's call it energy security, we have access cheap and abundant U.S. gas. And when we talk about energy transition, Mexico has its own clean energy resources. So the conditions are there, the fundamental conditions are there. What we need, I think, is, uh, let's call it uh, clear, stable, and predictable energy policies that can allow us to develop the full potential. And very importantly, I mean, well, we need a close regional coordination. This is not a Mexico-only project. We're talking about the integration of the economies of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. We should be talking about the integration of our energy policies, regional energy policies. I fully agree with you about both the importance of certainty and the importance of regional coordination. But Tanya, as you said, the conditions are there. And in order for Mexico to satisfy the increased demand for electricity, not only from manufacturers, but also from the fact that Mexico is transforming into a digital economy, what do you see as the main bottlenecks? What is impeding Mexico from reaching its potential? Okay, let me divide it in two parts because, I mean, the, the future of energy is definitely electric, right? We're, we're, we're looking at the electrification of energy. In fact, I mean, 20 years ago, we used to talk, we didn't speak about energy policy. We spoke about oil policy, about, right, the policy around oil, not about electricity. The future is definitely electric. And, and that is, in fact, how you uh, reduce the, the emissions of the energy sector in general. So you have, I mean, that part of the equation where the key is obviously the source of that energy, which has to in, be increasingly clean. We should be continue to go towards uh, renewable. But the key to electrification is actually not only generation, but transmission. Transmission is the key. I heard an, an expert say recently, there's no transition without transmission, right? The resources or the, that clean energy will not get to the end user. And, and that's particularly important with renewable energy, because if you're looking at a gas fire power plant, you can uh, essentially locate it anywhere you want. If you're looking at a wind generation facility, it has to be where the wind is, right? So that's not necessarily as close as you can be to the demand center. So building those transmission systems is critical. And in most cases, it's either the direct responsibility of, of the state or the state has a very important role to play because these are natural, transmission lines are natural monopolies. In the case of Mexico, it's reserved in the Mexican constitution to the Mexican state. So that's a critical role for our Mexican state utility, the CFE, to play. I would say if CFE were to focus on one and one activity only, it should be transmission and distribution. And the, the difference is essentially transmission are the large uh, power lines that go from one city to the other or from the generation facility to the city. Distribution are the lines within the city. So the challenge of electrification, yes, it's in the in generation, but it's much more on transmission. And these projects first are either the direct responsibility of the state, as it's the case in Mexico, or are very heavily regulated by state governments or federal governments, as is the case uh, in the U.S. And there's also a high level of complexity around this project, because being linear projects, you go through different communities, through different environments. So they are, in a sense, very disruptive. So on the electrification side, yes. I mean, we should be increasingly generating with renewables, but the focus should be on transmission. If we do not invest in transmission, we will not be able to achieve our goals. But the other portion, which is interesting, and people don't talk about it as often, is there are processes that still require an, a molecule. Are there are processes that cannot rely on electricity. Think about an airplane. It's very hard to think about an airplane running on a battery, a, a ship 
a vessel, uh, some even some heavy industrial processes that require heat. Those processes still require a molecule. Today, that molecule is natural gas. It's, let's call it the cleanest hydrocarbon, but that molecule is also evolving towards maybe hydrogen or what we call e-methane. So we should also be thinking about how we supply that clean molecule to the market. Tanya. Before we discuss gas, let me just ask you a follow-up question about electricity and, as you said, about the importance of transmission. I have read that companies in Mexico, as well as some industrial parks, must invest in generating their own electricity and even in power lines because there are just not enough lines provided by the government. I have also read that delays to securing electricity interconnections are hampering the development of industrial parks and that companies in specific areas are actually suffering from repeated power outages even once they are connected. Can you just tell us what is the state of our grid and of our transmission infrastructure? I think we're I mean, looking at two key factors that are affecting power supply in Mexico. First, uh, CFE has under-invested in transmission for many decades. And you can see this in the production, in the, in the, let's call it, official plans. When you see year after year how investment in transmission is lagging behind because there are other more urgent needs or for whatever reasons. But even I mean, the current CFE administration will tell you that they are lagging behind in investment in, trans, in, in transmission. And on the other hand, we have, I would say, unexpected economic growth or power demand as a result of, of nearshoring. So we are seeing a lot of pressure from industries that either are already in Mexico, want to expand, or new industries wanting to come to Mexico and not being able to secure a sufficient power at the right price, with the right quality, and ideally, or in many cases, necessarily uh, clean power. Um, so how do we solve that? Again, first, CFE needs to invest in transmission and distribution. Depending on where these industrial parts are located or industrial consumers are located, they will need to build a transmission line to interconnect to a certain point to the grid, right? And that's where the cost can really elevate. If the industries are not in the right location where they have uh, efficient access to the grid. I mean, you can you can be uh, spending literally in, uh, having to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in that interconnection. The other solution, which I would call, let's call it, it's, it's more of a short-term uh, solution, more of a band-aid solution, is for these facilities to generate their own power. But that has limitations. It's not necessarily as efficient. Industries, obviously, as any business have limited access to capital. So you have to decide if you're investing capital in your own manufacturing processes or in power generation. But I would say that that is a short-term bandit. We are seeing a lot of industrial uh, parks launching uh, fairly aggressive initiatives, for example, on solar panels, right? Industrial parks by nature, a lot of rooftops. So, so that is taking place. But uh, yes, we need to we need to move very quickly on ensuring that we have the right transmission and distribution infrastructure in place to be able to take advantage of all of this nurturing process. We are seeing a lot of pressure in the system. What are the areas of the country that are suffering the most? Primarily at the, let's call it, at the ends of the system, in the peninsula, the Baja Peninsula, the Yucatan Peninsula, we're seeing a lot of pressure there. And interestingly, the Baja Peninsula, it's a place where a lot of the companies want to relocate, right? Because it's the California market. So that's where we're seeing more and more pressure and where I understand CFE is also focusing its effort to strengthen uh, the transmission in both regions. Let's talk gas now. Mexico is certainly a very large consumer of gas and also an importer of gas. But we have access to some of the world's cheapest gas imports that actually come from Texas. If my numbers are correct, we import about 80% of natural gas from the U.S. Tanya, are there any projects right now to expand pipeline capacity, not only from the U.S. into Mexico, but also within Mexico? Mexico 
amount of living, depending on the amounts, we're importing 70, 75% of natural, Mexico's natural gas uh, demand. Uh, during the past 15 years, Mexico has made a, a successful effort of expanding gas interconnection with, with, with the United States. So I believe that we have sufficient infrastructure in place to bring gas from the production basins in the United States into Mexico. What is still needed as you, as you get closer to or Midwest or Bajio, and even more so as you get to Southern Mexico, there is insufficient pipeline capacity on one hand. And on the other hand, Mexico has developed this very large trunk lines going north to south, but we still need to focus on interconnections going, let's call it east to west, west to east. Now, there are a couple of large pipelines being built, one of them by uh, TC Energy, into southern Mexico, into Coatzacoalcos, and the, uh, there are other pipelines that are being expanded to the Yucatan Peninsula, and there are also constraints going, let's call it, from uh, the Mexican Gulf Coast to the Pacific, again, projects underway. For example, to realize the full potential of what we call the Corredor Transismico, we need to ensure sufficient gas supply. But I would say the gas system is fairly mature. I get a question that's not discussed very often is, shouldn't Mexico be developing its own natural gas resources, right? Correct. The bases that exist in, in Texas, many of them, of course, extend into Mexico, right? Um, Pemex today is prioritizing uh, crude oil production, but Mexico has its own natural gas resources. So again, today we have access to cheap and abundant natural gas, but uh, I think there's a conversation to be had about how and when Mexico develops its own natural gas resources. What about our own storage capacity? Actually, do we have any? And how is that important for energy security? What is your take on this, Tania? Do you think Mexico should be investing more in gas storage capacity, maybe only to mitigate the impact of weather-related events, like, for example, the one we saw in Texas a few years ago? I'll tell you, the quick answer is yes, we definitely should. Natural gas, um, the most efficient way to transport and, and, and store gas, it's in its gas form. And in order to do that, you store it underground. Either it can be depleted oil caverns, it can be uh, depleted salt mines, but you store it underground in very, very large facilities. So you essentially interconnect your pipeline system to these underground domes. Uh, and when you have any type of disruptions, it can be weather, it can be an accident on the pipeline, it can be planned maintenance, then you can take that natural gas out of the ground. Uh, Mexico does not have any, any, underground natural gas storage, zero. So we're depending on the gas that is flowing through our pipelines. If there is a disruption, like what happened with the Texas trees two years ago, uh, we were relying on, on essentially the gas that was already inside the pipelines. We do not have any storage. So that is very, very urgent for the, I mean, to ensure energy security. The storage that Mexico has is in the form of liquefied natural gas. So that's natural gas that goes through a temperature exchange process, and then uh, you can reduce the size of the, of the molecules and put them in the tank. Uh, but those tanks are essentially for originally built for imports, now they're being used for exports. But they're really not for the purpose of storing gas and for ensuring energy security. So that is very, very important, let's call it pending homework for Mexico. Now that you mention liquefied natural gas, it is one of the areas that you oversee in SEMPRA. And uh, I, Mexico recently inaugurated its first LNG plant, but others, I, I believe both onshore and floating facilities are planned in both the Gulf of Mexico and also in the Pacific coast. What is the strategy behind these projects and how will they contribute to North America? The, the LNG story in North America is 
I would say, as an exception, a story of an integrated regional energy policy. The United States, I mean, 20 years ago, did not have sufficient natural gas supply. The United States was a, was an importer of natural gas, and now it has become the world's most important exporter. We are what we're doing today as Empra, as well as other companies, is that we are using the existing first, obviously, the, the existing gas that's been produced in the United States, but the existing infrastructure that's already in place in terms of pipelines and in terms of storage facilities, the tanks I was talking about, to be able to convert that natural gas into liquid, put it on a vessel, and send it overseas. So it is really an integrated value chain. You're producing natural gas in the United States, transporting it through the pipeline systems into the Mexico's Gulf Coast and into Mexico Pacific. You're liquefying it, putting it into ships and sending it to Asia and Europe, creating an investment opportunity for the region. And obviously, I mean, at a very critical time, helping ensure uh, energy security in both, I mean, Europe, Asia, and other parts of the world. Th that is essentially the story. Uh, Sempra has had a very active role. We're the only company that has uh, facilities both in the Gulf Coast in the United States and in the Pacific Coast, we're building a liquefaction facility in Ensenada. So, I mean, it's a great story, not only about energy uh, security, but also about energy transition. This natural gas, depending on where it's going, but I mean, a good example is Asia, uh, is substituting other less clean or dirtier uh, fuels such as, I mean, fuel oil and diesel. So I think, I mean, LNG is really becoming a very, very important player in the global discussion around energy security. At the beginning of this podcast, you spoke about Mexico's large and diversified base of energy resources. We have enormous solar and wind potential, but we could be generating much more than we currently do. What would it take, Tanya, for us to start tapping really into this potential? Has to do, I mean, the demand is there. We're lacking the transmission. Uh, today, it's challenging to bring more renewables into the system because, again, trans there are constraints in the transmission capability. And also, again, I mean, investments in energy infrastructure first, I mean, they're very intensive in capital. You need literally hundreds of millions or dollar of dollars or sometimes billions of dollars to be able to develop these facilities. And uh, which means that you need to take very long-term views on these assets. And in order to do that, in order to be able to, to basically ensure that you have, I mean, the capital or the support for, for, for banks, from banks, um, you need a very clear and stable regulatory framework in order to be able to make this investment. As we know, Mexico will have a presidential election next June. And at least for, for now, the two leading candidates have very different perspectives about open markets and competition. Nonetheless, Tanya, are you optimistic about the next administration, whomever that is, and their ability to understand that in order to attract the billions of dollars, required for this project, that they will need to create the necessary conditions to attract these investments, or we will just let them slip away? I am optimistic. I think there's, I mean, obviously we have elections around the corner, but I think there's overall consensus that Mexico needs to guarantee reliable, clean supply of energy in order to be able to attract these investments. Uh, let's call it the magnitude of the challenge is so great that there needs to be collaboration between public and private sector. Hopefully, whomever is the next president will certainly take a more pragmatic approach, in, at least in understanding this. Tanya, the Mexican government pledged to build an enormous solar park and transmission lines under the Sonora plan. This uh, will focus in trying to help the, some of the industrial demand up in the north of Mexico. What is your assessment of this project and will it be enough? I would call it a pilot project. It's an interesting project. 
the, the full potential of that opportunity will require important investments, again, in transmission. But, I mean, my question should be, I mean, why Sonora only, right? Why not have a Tamaulipas plan, a Yucatan plan, a Oaxaca plan? I mean, we should be reproducing. It should not be Zacatecas only. And again, again, transmission is the key to unlocking uh, the full potential of that plan. Throughout this conversation, if there is one theme that appears to be critical is the importance for the government to invest in building transmission lines. And because they have the monopoly, it becomes even more important because it is not as if anyone else can come in and substitute. So Tanya, why isn't the CFE just doing it? What are they doing instead? What do they tell, for example, business people when they complain about the lack of supply? I would say that uh, CFE is starting to focus on transmission. I think, again, all this unexpected uh, nearshoring wave, some growth or the, the recovery of the Mexican economy, of the regional economy, in fact, has really caused CFE to, to look at transmission needs. And I mean, their analysis are their way and CFE is already looking at making those investments. If you could pick only one wish that you could ask from the Mexican government that would allow Mexico's renewable industry to flourish, what would you ask from them? I would say that we require much closer collaboration between public and private sector. I think there is a role for both public and private sector to play. And I think for all investors, and, and that would be, I mean, in any speaking about any government, in any sector, it's uh, clarity and stability on the regulatory framework in order to undertake these very long-term investments. But public, public-private uh, communication, collaboration, and discussion, I would say, is key. Well, Tanya, unfortunately, we have come to the end of this episode, and I will certainly close by stressing the importance of having certainty in the regulatory framework and uh, to allow sort of for all of this potential in the nearshoring sector to really to flourish. Again, I congratulate you in your new position and please come back to the podcast. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. It's a very interesting conversation and a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 